Yes, yes, you are the baby. I know. Hey y'all, my name is Nat. I hope you're having a terrific day today. And for this video, we are gonna be doing a ARC reading vlog. All right, before we get into anything bookish, make sure to hit like and subscribe down below, as well as tell me in the comments, are you interested in these books? Are they on your TBR? Are you planning to read them now? Let's talk about it. Thank you so much to NetGalley, the publishers, and the authors for ebook copies in exchange for an honest review of these. I am very excited. The two books I'm going to be talking about with y'all today. First is How to Solve Your Own Murder by Kristen Perrin. This will be coming out on March 26th and is following a young woman who ends up trying to investigate the death of her great aunt. Fortunately, for her, her great aunt has also been investigating her own death for the last few decades after receiving this really cryptic and unsettling fortune from a fortune teller at a carnival. Honestly, I just saw for fans of Knives Out and Thursday Murder Club, even though I haven't read that book yet, and automatically requested it. So I actually am currently about 20% into it, but we're not going to get into a review just yet. I will also be talking about The Angel of Indian Lake by Stephen Graham Jones, which also should be coming out on March 26th. This is the third and final installment in the Indian Lake trilogy, with the first being My Heart is a Chainsaw and the second being Don't Fear the Reaper. I actually had an ARC copy of the second one as well, so I'll put a link to that review in the cards up above, as well as a link to my original review for My Heart is a Chainsaw. With this being the third book in a series, it's gonna be really hard to talk about it without getting into spoilers. I sort of managed it in my second vlog. However, honestly, I think I'm just gonna go ahead and say now, don't watch that section of the video if you don't want to be spoiled for the last two books. I won't go into any specifics, but you know, like I said, it's going to be really hard to talk about the third book in a series without getting into anything from the prior two books. I do my best to remain spoiler free, but this is one of the circumstances where I just don't know if that's going to happen. I will have timestamps for both books, but I do think it'll be pretty obvious whenever I finish out How to Solve Your Own Murder, seeing as how I've already started into it. Which on that note, let's go ahead and talk about my thoughts so far. As I mentioned, I'm about 20% in, and when I started started into this, I really only knew that we were going to be following the great niece. I didn't know we were actually going to sort of have the perspective of the aunt Frances herself, but we sort of do get to see her perspective through diary entries starting back from when she was 17. This book actually begins with us seeing her visiting the fortune teller and hearing this fortune. And while she is investigating her own quote murder that is supposed to take place, she also is looking into the disappearance of her best friend Emily. And that definitely made my intrigue skyrocket because clearly, I mean, there's two mysteries going on and they must be interwoven together. So I'm really excited. And we're already starting to see some of the characters in both timelines. I'm already making predictions. I am already sniffing things out. We'll, we'll see where things go. I'm intrigued. Annie as a character is a little, she's a little twee. She's a little, little like reminiscent to Zoe de Chanel personality. <laughs> she's very quirky. She was raised by a single mother who is a relatively successful artist in London proper. And recently she has decided to try and turn her passion for writing into an actual career. Apparently didn't take the time to like actually edit her novel before sending it out to publishers. <laughs> That's a choice. Though Annie never actually met Frances in her life, she does feel this connection to her uh, and she is wanting to try and figure out who is responsible for what happened to her and I, I do appreciate that. Plus I did like that whenever she kind of starts thinking about how the other people with her reacted, she realizes, well, if I was writing a murder mystery, I would think this about that person because they did that thing or I would be trying to insinuate this about this person because they did this and reacted this way. It's just an interesting perspective because I mean I feel like a lot of the cozier mysteries I've read there tends to be like the main character loves books but in this one she actually is a writer so she's coming at it from a writing standpoint which is is kind of different. Oh and then also when she is at Frances's house for the first time she comes across two giant murder boards that this woman had. One for her own murder and the other for the disappearance of her friend Emily. Kind of just makes Frances, who seems as though she's this very prim and proper older woman, a bit kooky and odd and I'm actually I'm really digging that. <laughs> So yeah, I haven't gotten super far into this. It's definitely the book that I just pick up occasionally when I'm struggling to go to sleep, but I am liking it so far and that is going well. <laughs> hey y'all, so honestly, I wasn't initially planning to film this update, but I figured I already have my filming set up and I just hit about the halfway point, so why not? I am halfway into How to Solve Your Own Murder and I'm really liking this actually. The drama that is taking place in Francis's timeline, the past, 
wild, okay? Wild. <laughs> it is so small town ridiculousness, but I am really invested. I cannot wait to figure out how that ties into the plot in the current timeline. I'm not the biggest fan of Annie as a character just because she doesn't do great in high stress situations. Twice now, she has almost had a panic attack whenever something really serious takes place. So, you know, not, not great for your detective character. I guess it would be one thing if she was experiencing anxiety, but we don't really see that in any other aspect of the story except for when there's a big dramatic reveal. Then she like kind of loses it. Actually, no, three times. Three times she has lost it. I will say with alternating timelines, there are a lot of characters involved because you have those that are relevant in the past and then you have those that are relevant in the future. Some of those people are the same and then some of the people in the future are like relatives to those in the past. It's it's a lot to follow. I do sort of feel like I need to make a flow chart for all of the characters that might possibly be involved in the murder. I also love Frances, the more we see of her. Initially as a teenager, she definitely doesn't seem like She's the take charge girl. With recent events, clearly she is. Like when it is necessary, she'll do it. And I love that about her. She ends up having kind of a happily ever after. So I'm, I'm happy in that regard, even if <laughs> she spent like the last 50 years of her life trying to figure out who's going to murder her and possibly ended up making somebody murder her because she was constantly getting herself involved in everybody else's business in this town. As far as plotting and intrigue goes, this is doing great. Like this is probably the first mystery book I've read lately that got me super sucked in really quickly. I also sort of feel like there's possibly going to be a romance developing between Annie and the police chief. That's not a guarantee. It's just sort of a vibe I'm getting. And I'm not really interested in it. I, this is supposed to become a series, so possibly if it's like slow burn, I would be more invested. We'll figure out how that goes though. As far as Annie goes in investigating the story, I do like that again, she keeps going back to, well, how would I reveal this if I was writing this mystery? Who would I cast suspicion on in this way? When she starts writing out notes for everybody, she treats it almost like she's making a character list and lists out the person's name and then starts breaking down like everything she knows about this person, all of the unanswered questions that this person is tied to. And I really, I really like those elements of the story. I think that's very interesting since she's not a cop herself like how is she actually going about doing this and then she is sort of starting to use her best friend character as a Watson by like bouncing ideas off her but that's only been over the phone not in person so I'm not sure how prevalent that will be as the story continues but one way or another like I said <laughs> the gossip elements have me sucked in and I'm so intrigued to see how mystery a connects to mystery b Hey y'all, so I got really sucked in to How to Solve Your Own Murder and finished out the rest of this book in a single day. I read a little bit on my lunch break and then like my boss was doing something on my computer so I couldn't do anything so I just continued reading there. Then once I got home I just laid on the couch until I finished it because I was so engrossed. Do you still think that there's just a few too many characters involved because of this having the dual timelines? But I did also like because of that you're like trying to figure out how they tie together in some way and whether crime B really was impacted because of crime A or not. I don't know, it makes you suspicious of so many more people, but there's such a large cast of characters that it is kind of hard to keep everybody straight. The writing itself though is just like so bingeable. I was so engrossed. I really liked Annie as a main character. I still think it's a little hilarious that you have your investigative character so squeamish when it comes to anything medical. I really liked how the reveal was played out and I did think that was very clever. I guessed an aspect of the final reveal. I did not suspect the other part of the story, which was really, I must applaud the author for that because it was an unexpected twist. But once the main character explained everything, it did make perfect sense for all of the evidence we'd been given in both timelines also. Even so, Annie does do the thing that a lot of investigators do in these sorts of stories where plan to put themselves in controlled danger, but then it's a lot more dangerous than they're anticipating and it bites them in the ass. So you, know, you want to like knock them upside the head and be like come on common sense dude but at the same time she like worked out everything very clever which you know applaud the author for having the wherewithal to think of all of those different things that would interact make this finale work i am intrigued as to where is the series going to go because i know it's going to become a series what mysteries are going to be taking place 
because this ends in a satisfying way. Everything wraps up. I guess the only aspect that doesn't is like the slight romance that I could feel brewing between Annie and the police investigator. Apart from that, like this was well rounded out. I don't think this is the best mystery book I've ever read, but I did really enjoy it. And as far as like cozy mysteries go, I think it was very, very bingeable. You just want attention so bad right now. Yeah, you do. So my call pile came down to 3.5 stars. I'd probably put this more at like a 3.75 because I did really enjoy it, even though there were a few issues I still had. I think as far as like a debut novel, this is really good. Yes, yes, you are the baby. I know. As far as a debut mystery novel goes, I think this is really good. And I could definitely see Perrin kind of like taking critiques from this one and building out a really great mystery novel next. Definitely enjoyed it, would recommend. It kind of feels like a cozy, but I do think it is a little bit higher stakes than cozies feel like. Hey y'all, so I really, really need to film this update. Otherwise, I'm just gonna keep reading this book and like never talk to you. But I am 30% into The Angel of Indian Lake and things do start slow, which isn't uncommon for the books in this series. I, once again, automatically I'm remembering why I like Jade so much. I'm gonna do my best to remain spoiler free about this book, but I can't guarantee spoilers for the previous books in this series, so forewarning you here. It's a few years after the nightmare that was the second book, and Jade is now actually a history teacher in this small town, and I love it. I love full circle moment for her. It's fantastic, but she is definitely suffering serious PTSD off of everything she's experienced, which makes total perfect sense. Which means that I basically just constantly want to wrap Jade up in a hug and protect her from the world. Uh, she and Letha are still best friends, which is so freaking cute. I love it. And I actually really enjoy Banner's character and how he's grown from like the obnoxious sort of frat kid <laughs> he was when we first met him in the first book. His interactions with Jade are just so much fun. Because they're on the same side, but like their personalities are just so inherently different, but like they don't really get a choice in having to be in each other's lives. And I really like that. Unsurprisingly, same to the two previous books, Stephen Graham Jones starts things off with a bang. We see some really unsettling crap going on in this town in the forest. And now though, I'm really thrown off because I can't figure out what direction the horror in this book is going to go. There's the possibility that there's a ghost, there's an escaped mental patient, there's now forest fires going on. Like I said, just like there's three directions there that I can't quite figure out which way the book is going to go, which one we're going to be focusing on. Oh, and then there was a grave robbing bit. And so of course, you know, Jade, like naturally, her inclination is to lean towards zombies. I don't think it's gonna be zombies, but you never know. I mean, like it could, if it's a ghost, it could be a zombie. So I am definitely digging this. I have to get used to Stevie Graham Jones's writing style once more because it's so stream of consciousness, but Jade's brain just bounces around so much. I have to get myself reused to reading from her perspective. I think it allows you to connect with Jade as a character so much more, especially since we're seeing so much more motion from her off of the events from the previous books and like how all of that stuff has really impacted her. She's so different from the girl you meet in the first one, but at the same time, there's so much of her that is just true to Jade that you, she can't shake off. And I, I do like that. In comparison to the first two books where we had the essays we would see from a certain character, this one, it's like we're reading police reports revolving around Jade in the last few years since she's kind of gotten settled into Proof Rock, but she obviously is still going through some crap. She's not always handling it in the most legal way, so. Hey y'all, so I have hit about the 80% mark into the Angel of Indian Lake, and unfortunately it's been a very slow going trek to hit this point. I was having a really hard time reading this ebook wise, which is so interesting because I read the first book audibly and like I, I enjoyed the first book, but I didn't love it. Then I read the second book on ebook because I had an arc of it as well, and I actually really enjoyed it so much more in ebook format. But now I'm just, having like a really difficult time getting enough momentum to keep working through this. When I was still reading this as an ebook, it was just really difficult for me to get very invested into the story to the point where like I did not want to stop reading. I just, I, that just wasn't happening, unfortunately. But seeing as how I did sort of procrastinate this video a little bit and was able to push it back, this publishing date already passed, so 
I was able to get the audiobook. <laughs> Thankfully, I had a Audible credit, and I've, I've been working through it a lot faster on audio this time. I'm having a hard time with the events of this book and like how the plot was laid out because there's a lot of excitement at the very beginning, and then things slow down. We kind of get to know where Jade is now after the next time skip, how the events of the last two books have really impacted Proof Rock and the feeling of this town, how the town feels about Terra Nova on the opposite side of the lake, all that sort of stuff. God, did it drag. It. I was just so slow moving. And then I was finally starting to hit some action scenes and I still felt like it was dragging, which is why I switched to doing the audio and it has been working for me a lot better in that format. The audiobook version of the story works so well with the writing style for Jade's perspective because it's so stream of consciousness, but it is very, very unfocused. It bounces around so much, just like Jade's head clearly does. One thing I am loving that is continuing from the previous books is all of the movie references. And this one has a lot of more modern movie references, which I thought was really clever because in the second book, like we know she's missed out on some of these movies due to her being in prison. And so she doesn't necessarily pick up on some of the references that are there, but you could tell like the author was obviously making those references. <laughs> this time around though, she is more up to date. She has shared her love of horror movies with Letha. And so I really liked some of the little ones she was pulling out, especially whenever there was like a reference to Bodies, Bodies, Bodies and Tucker and Dale versus Evil, because first off, I thought that was just a very clever thing to do within the story. How that twist is utilized in both those movies also is just really clever. Plus, I mean, Tucker and Dale vs. Evil is just a classic. It's so good. We have had a doozy of a day. A real doozy. In regard to the horror bits with the plot, there is so much going on. And that's like another issue I'm having here is I just feel like there's too many plot lines. And it's weird to say that because they all tie in together, but it's just so much. Without getting into specifics, it's managed to be all of those things and none of those things. I don't know, it just feels so busy. Every time there's a new reveal tying back to like one of those possibilities, another one. There was one scene that was a punch in the gut and I did think how it was written was very well handled, especially through Jade's eyes, seeing how she is already suffering from PTSD. And I hate saying this, but it actually kind of feels like we sort of dwelled on it a little too much, especially with all of the excitement happening. Why, why, do we, why do we keep pulling back to that? I, I feel like we should kind of move away from it at this point. I'm, I'm really sad that I'm not loving this more, unfortunately. I am, you know, like I said, I'm 80% in. At the current listening time, I think I have about an hour and a half left in the audio. Like, I, honestly, I think I'm gonna look at this series uh, with Don't Fear the Reaper being a standalone. <laughs> Hey y'all, so I officially finished out The Angel of Indian Lake yesterday. Did like how this book wrapped up, I will say that. I actually thought that was pretty clever as far as a way to like connect everything that's happened throughout the series. There was this moment that was a total emotional punch in the gut. I loved the way it called back to some of the like underlying problems addressed earlier in the series. I thought that was really smart. It made that punch hurt so much more but then it also made like the relief you feel afterwards that much more satisfying it's really hard to talk about that without specifics but yeah i i did really like that i think the way this book ended was really satisfying it very impactful but again oh my god it dragged so much to get here especially with how everything rounded out at the end i think it just reinforced the fact that certain elements throughout the book weren't really needed they made the horror more grotesque. It definitely reinforced the fact that like this is a slasher story. But again, I don't really think certain elements of the plot were really necessary by the end. I, I actually think like, two sort of big bads should have been focused on and I think that would have allowed them to have so much more impact and also would have would have made me more anxious and like provided more suspense in the story but I think because there were too many going on it's it just seemed overwhelming and a bit silly so I didn't feel as uncomfortable reading this as I really should have been as I was in like Don't Fear the Reaper but again I do think that final climax was well done I like how things wrapped up at the end the middle. The middle was an issue. 
I still love Jade's character. I love her relationship with Letha and by extension her relationship with Banner that we get to see in this book. Again, it took me some getting used to once more for Jade's perspective and how she is written, but I do think it fits so perfectly with Jade's character and seeing the development she has really gone through in the series is so great. I mean, it, the writing of her character is just fantastic. I will definitely acknowledge that and I'm glad that of this author's characters like we got so much of her because I, re I really do just love her and you can tell so many pieces of these stories are callbacks to some of the author's favorite horror movies some of like the most influential horror movies of our society and I do love those I love all of the callbacks I love the little references that you pick up on I love watching Jade and Letha kind of like tossing back and forth these movie jokes but again I just didn't love this because of how everything in the middle just was meshed together. In the acknowledgements, the author actually commented that he didn't really have a plan going into this one, and I think you can feel that. I think because this went in so many different directions, it was as though he couldn't figure out which one he wanted, so he just did all of them, made them work together with that final reveal. But I think it would have worked so much better if just like one or two of them had really been focused on. In particular, I'd probably say like the zombie element angle and the fire. I think I would have liked those two the most. The callback to Don't Fear the Reaper was interesting. I don't think it really had enough time in the plot for like that shock to really be impactful. I just, I, yeah, I'm, I'm bummed that I didn't love this more. It does wrap out the final of the series in a satisfying way. Like the final hundred pages of it is, is a great ending, I will say that. My cough pile came down to three stars, meaning this was not the most successful arc reading vlog I've had. Honestly, I've kind of been pulling away from Neck Alley lately just because I've realized that I hate having to read on my phone. I don't like reading on my phone. It's, it's such a thing for me that I'm just learning. Maybe I really need to just start trying to request physical arcs from publishers. I guess maybe I should start trying to do that now that my channel has gotten a little bit bigger. Tis a sad day. But anyway, on that note, thank you so much for coming to my channel today, y'all. I really appreciate it. Make sure to hit like and subscribe down below. If you made it all the way to the end of this video, leave me a bear emoji in the comments. I have all my socials as well as a few ways you can support me linked in the description. I come out with videos on Monday and Friday, but until then, I hope you continue to have a terrific day. Love you, bye!